This conference will now okay. be recorded. Exactly. Okay. It's perfect. Right. Can you guys hear me? Loud and clear? We can hear you, Larry. Okay, great. So let's start our session. Basically, we'll see what is basically AWS. And before that, we will start with the basics of the cloud computing because AWS is a part of cloud computing. And we need to first understand what exactly a cloud computing is and how it distributes your load and it, uh, you know, distributing system it performs. So anyone you have, have idea how this, uh, uh, how this cloud computing system works? Uh, Lalit, uh, just to give you the background of the team, like you know, you, you consider you know, uh, all the members are you know the uh, freshers uh, for this topic, so that that will be you, know, you can keep it as a basic and you can get started with the discussion. Even though like one or two people have worked on uh, the AWS on earlier side, but a very basic level. So um, I keep that assumption as like you know all are freshers and you know we get started with this session. Okay, so. Uh, you mean to say all our freshers, like uh, from the basics, we need to start, right? Sorry, I didn't get you. Can you come over once again, Gopi? Yes, uh, yeah. Okay. So we'll see from the basics now. Uh, what is your uh, from the basics? What is cloud computing? How cloud computing distributes this network? And we'll go ahead with the then AWS. So that will cover from the basics to the advanced. Thanks. So starting with the cloud computing. <clears throat> what is cloud computing? A cloud company is nothing but a company or a vendor that gives you a computing power, database, storage, and networking. These four options. These four services a company offers you on rent purpose, on rent or lease wise, that is called as a cloud company. Now, again, there is a one constraint with this cloud computing platform that is this services needs to be accessible from the internet so when we say computing power that is server database storage or other networking parts that we use and connect to with our application on the internet that is considered as a cloud computing <clears throat> now with this cloud computing future that we get from the third party vendors on the rented purpose the number of hours we want, the number of time we want, we can take it. That is, is pay as you go model. If you require a particular service for the next 30 minutes or 300 minutes or three years, you can use this. And as long as you use the service, you need to pay that for. When we talk specifically about the AWS, if you use any server for 30 minutes, one hour or 10 days, you need to only pay for that particular period of time. The rest of the period, you don't need to pay any for anything for that. AWS specifically, when we talk, it gives you more than hundreds of services. So whenever you create an AWS account, you don't get charged for all the hundreds of services. You get only charged for the consumption you make for that particular number of services. So out of these hundreds of services, if you use only one service for a very short period of time, you will get charged for that. Now, this is a model of a cloud computing. This is not only about the AWS, Google Cloud, Azure Cloud, or any other cloud service provider will go on the same business model. They will also charge you same per hourly basis, per minute basis, whatever the, their business model is. So, cloud computing is an on-demand delivery of compute. On-demand means whenever you want a service particular, you will get it at that time. If you require a one server right now, you can have it. Whereas when we compare from an on-premise infrastructure, if you want to create a server, then you need to uh, first design your data centers. You must have the data center that has uh, all the features uh, re with respect to the fire extinguishers, networking, internet, etc. Everything you need to make sure. Then you need to buy a servers. You will configure everything. And then that server will be helpful to deploy your application. But when it comes to the cloud computing, you don't need to worry about all these things, designing the data centers, configuring the servers and everything. Whenever you request this, 
by default you get a server uh, whenever you request the number of servers you get it and your job start from booting up that machine so you don't need to worry about the data centers you don't need to worry about the uh, you don't need to worry about the uh, maintaining the data centers configuring all the things at all so that is the futures between a cloud computing platform and an on-premise infrastructure all right Now going to the second point, how you can take a benefit from cloud compared to an on-premise infrastructure. If you see the on-premise infrastructure limitations, then we cannot scale to when we want. For example, if currently on my on-premise infrastructure, there are four servers, let's consider. And today, let's say on my e-commerce site, I have a sale. So definitely, if there is a sale, the number of users will be more comparatively to your normal users. If you consider normally on my e-commerce side, there are 10,000 active users at all the time. So on the sale time, definitely there will be more than 10,000 of requests, 10,000 more than 10,000 of users who is continuously active on my site. So when we consider these options on an on-premise infrastructure, we need to scale our system. We need to scale our infrastructure. When we had four servers, now might require five servers, six servers, 10 servers, depending upon the sale and how many, so, you know, traffic you have, how many customers you are getting on your site. Based on that, you need to scale that infrastructure. Now going ahead with the same example, with the same model, when we say we need to, scale our infrastructure it means we need to spend a lot of money because when we talk about the infrastructure on premise we need to buy all the servers we need to make sure that your data centers had that all the capacity uh, all the space to reserve all the instances and everything correct so at that time it become very difficult to manage at the same time like tomorrow we have a sale and a week before we are getting this information that there is a sale there is a high spike so we need to increase our size. So it becomes very difficult. And even if it's easy to create a new servers and to configure everything, then also you need to pay total upfronts. You need to buy the servers, you need to do all these things. Now comparison of this on-premise infrastructure with the cloud, you don't need to worry about anything here. If tomorrow is your sale, you can just configure extra four servers, extra 10 servers, extra 100 servers right now. You don't need to even request to any cloud service vendor that uh, tomorrow I will require this number of servers. Please allocate for my AWS account. You don't need to do that. If you require it right now, you can get it. So this is a very big advantage that you can scale your infrastructure whenever you want. It's called having a flexibility on the cloud system. Upgrading your infrastructure from four servers to 10 servers to hundreds of servers and coming back to normal position that's 100 to again 40 servers to 20 servers if your business is not running if you are having a low infrastructure during the uh, weekends then you can do this so these are the top benefits this is the mostly the reason why companies are migrating their projects migrating their infrastructure to the aws cloud and at the same time it gives us initiative to the startups that you don't need to buy anything here you don't need to create any data centers you don't need to create an infrastructure without paying anything for that a startup can build their product on the aws cloud so these are the top benefits why one should go for a cloud computing platform that is trade capital expense you don't need to buy anything here you don't need to design your infrastructure you don't need to do anything here the amount of usage you do on your cloud computing platform you need to pay only for that. Elasticity, that is you can easily scale and downgrade your infrastructure. Just consider like our elastic rubber. Our elastic rubber, when we stretch, it stretches automatically, stretches. And when we stop it stretching, it comes back to its original position. So same features, there is an AW service called auto scaling. It provides you. Auto scaling is a service that will automatically scale whenever there is a demand and it will shrink back to its original position. 
So if you map with your existing example that there is a high spike on your, uh, you know, e-commerce side during the sale, then during the sale, this auto scaling will automatically configure few more servers based on your requirement. And if the traffic goes down during the evening or at night, then it will shrink back to its original position, back to two servers, four servers, and number of servers that you existed before. So it gives that elastic features. You can automatically add the number of servers and shrink back to its original position based on the requirement. Then deploy global in minutes. That is, you can deploy your services on AWS Cloud within minutes because of its uh, flexibility over deploying the services. And at the same time, you can configure your servers sitting anywhere in this world because cloud computing main aim is to provide the virtual power on the internet. So as this all the services are connected to the internet, we can connect to our infrastructure sitting anywhere in this world. So we can go global in minutes. And lastly, cost saving. Now to understand this cost saving future, let's assume a scenario. You have an on-premise infrastructure which require four servers every week to run. All right, you have four servers to maintain all the different traffic that you are getting every week. Now let's consider a game day, a game challenge that on Monday, Tuesday and Saturday, Sunday, you have a very low traffic. Less than two servers are consumed on this particular four days. And rest of the three days, you have a high spike on your infrastructure. Let's just assume the scenario. But as you are on pre on premise, you have already purchased every four servers. You have configured everything. So here you need to pay for all the four servers. Whatever the configuration you have done, you need to do, and you need to pay all the four servers. So it doesn't matter how many traffic you are getting on Monday, Tuesday, Saturday, Sunday, or on the rest of the three days. Still, you need to pay for the four servers. But on AWS, on cloud computing, you have a features called game day that can automatically shift and lift your infrastructure whenever you require. So you can configure, instead of configuring four servers at a time, you can only configure one or two servers. And on the rest of the three days, when you have a high spike, it will automatically update that infrastructure to meet the requirement. It will may upgrade to three servers, four servers, or five servers whatever the demand will be and again it will come back when the demand is no more required that is on saturday sunday so if you consider monday tuesday and saturday sunday when we had a low spike at the time we are actually saving two servers so two servers for 24 24 24 24 hours which is a very big cost when you compare this amount to with your ec2 machine charges this becomes very massive and as per the business model when we consider this becomes very effective we offer designing a solution on aws cloud so these are the top such benefit and we'll see in detail what are how you can optimize the cost uh, depends on different kinds of aws managed services and everything all right any question any doubt in this part It looks good then later. Okay, great. Just please uh, keep interactive. Like if you have anything, let me know so that it becomes easy for me to understand where you understand where not. So we already know that cloud computing is a virtualization technique. That is, it distributes your resources into multiple resources. And that resources, when we interact on the internet, it becomes cloud computing like computing power, storage, database, all these resources, when comes up online that we can interact from anywhere, it becomes a cloud computing platform. Now cloud computing platform uses virtualization technique. If you have ever used this software called VMware or VirtualBox in your operating system on your system, then you might heard of this like virtualization concept. So what this virtualization machine does or virtualization technique does is, let's consider I have a Mac machine, okay? Mac machine has eight GB of minimum RAM 
and 120 of GP minimum configuration for SSD storage and uh, some processor there, A12, A11 processor. Now, if I install VirtualBox or VMware on this machine, then what it will do? It will take some resources from my system, from my hardware. Out of this 8 GB of RAM, out of this A11 processor, out of this uh, you know, SSD storage, it will take a part of these resources and it will create another system for me. That system may be a Windows machine, that system may be a Linux machine, that may be a, another Mac machine. That's up to you. What, which one you want to configure. So this is the technique done by, the, this can be done by the virtualization technique. Now virtualization makes sure that whatever the hardware consumption that this virtual machine is doing, that will be completely isolated from other virtual machine. That is, on top of this host operating system, you have virtual machine, now, whatever the number of resources that it will create, number of operating system it will create, all operating system will be identical and they will be completely having isolated network. So that any data will not be shared from one system to another system. Let's consider there are two operating system, host op uh, virtual operating system running. Now, any data will not be shared from one virtual machine to another virtual machine. So this completely isolation part is very important when it comes to cloud computing also. Because cloud computing, again, it's a completely virtual concept and it totally depends on the virtualization. Your AWS, your Google Cloud, Azure Cloud, whatever the cloud for, uh, vendor you will choose, all works on this virtualization technique. They have their virtual uh, environments, they, they use their own virtual environments on top of which they create a system for you. Now, if you see here, there is a host operating system, which may be your Windows operating system. And on this Windows operating system, we have one VMware or any virtual machine that has created another two machines. Now, the thing that we need to consider or we need to remember is these two virtual machine has uses the same kernel as provided by your host operating system. This virtual machine uses the kernel information of the host operating system to design that infrastructure. It's called para-virtualization. In virtualization concept, it's called para-virtualization, which means your virtual machine takes the kernel properties of the host operating system to design that infrastructure on the cloud. Now, the second concept is hyper-virtualization. Hyper-virtualization is a concept where there is no operating system available. This host operating system is not available. Directly on top of the hardware, there is a virtual machine available. This virtual machine directly interact to the hardware and create a resources for you. That is instead of having this operating system, there is a hardware available. Virtual machine uses this hardware to allocate a resources for your guest operating system. So this is Hyper virtual, hyper virtual machine. So these are two. And AWS supports both kind of virtual machines, para virtualization and hyper virtualization. Now one of this guest operating system may be your server. The server that you have created on the cloud, it can be one of them. So cloud computing uses same technique to deploy your machines on the cloud. There is architecture, here we have that is a traditional architecture on an on-premise infrastructure. You have a hardware. On top of the hardware, you have an operating system. That is, on the top of my hardware machine, I have a Mac machine, Mac operating system. And on top of this Mac operating system, I can run any application I want. But when it comes to the virtual server, on virtual server, there is a hardware. On top of the hardware, there is a hypervisor. A hypervisor is nothing but your virtual machine. The virtual machine that does this isolation part. And on top of that, you can create multiple resources that you want. One of the operating system may be a Linux, another can be a Windows, another can be anything else. But the common scenario here is 
who all the operating system uses a common hardware. This is called as shared responsibility. That is share sharing of the hardware. Now here, uh, for some companies, there, there may be any compliance issue that we cannot share our hardware with any other company. It comes to our compliance issue. So for that, AWS offers you dedicated hardware. The difference between a default hardware and the dedicated hardware is, this is the default hardware that in an operating system or the uh, hardware is shared between multiple AWS customers. But with a dedicated hardware, a single hardware is dedicated to a single customer only. And now it's up to you how many servers you want to create. That is on top of the hardware, you can create 10 server, 20 server, 40 server, 100 server. Based on that hardware capability, it's up to you. Same you can do with the shared hardware, but the shared hardware is something, the hardware is shared between different AWS customers. But AWS guarantees you that your data will be completely isolated from another AWS account, from another EC2 machine, that is server. So these two operating systems will never share the data. These two operating systems will be always isolated. All right. And on top of this uh, operating system, you can have any application that you want, maybe a PHP, .NET, whatever the application you want to run, you can run here. Another I have a question. I have a question. Yes, please. Yeah, who have a question? Can you hear me? You need to just mute your uh, audio. You need to mute your uh, you know sound. It's echoing. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you, but your voice is echoing just. Hello. 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 Yeah. Um. Yeah, can you hear me? So there is a there is a chat option also, wherein anyone, if not able to speak, can put a chat here. So I have just sent a message to everyone. Hope uh, everyone is able to view this message. It goes in everyone and from uh, Lalit to all the participants can see the message here. Yes, I can. So see even it. if anyone don't wants to speak, can put down this question in the message and Lalit can pick it from here. Yeah, are you writing something? Uh, well, if you continue with that later or no, uh, we'll send you the questions. Okay, okay, cool, no issues. So we have now next topic that is cloud service models how you can deploy this architecture, how you can design your infrastructure on the cloud. Now, different companies offer you different kinds of services. As you can see, we have three kinds of models here, IAS, PAS, and SAS. That is infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. Now, there are a lot of companies who provide you SAS as a platform and platform as a service, platform and a SAS as a service, we have seen a lot of time before. 
like Google Drive. Gmail is also a software as a service. Whatever the mails we do, whatever the transaction we do of the attachments, these attachments are basically stored on the Gmail server. So that can be used as a, that can be termed as a software as a service. Platform as a service is like uh, any shared hosting provider, GoDaddy, HostGator. Basically, this provides us, uh, us a platform of server and a small storage space where we can deploy our code and application. So in general, we have seen this platforms as a service and software as a service in our day-to-day -day life previously. Now that part comes is an infrastructure as a service. On this infrastructure as a service is a service over which you can design any kind of infrastructure we want. Now just consider an example of uh, Netflix, Amazon Prime, or uh, NASA applications, or the applications which are very giant, Apple infrastructure. These infrastructure cannot be deployed on a platform as a service, like a GoDaddy provider or a host scatter provider, because their infrastructure is very huge, their traffic is very huge. You cannot use the small storage space to design your entire infrastructure. So for that time, when it considered to that level of uh, you know infrastructure we have an infrastructure as a service that provides the core four services computing storage networking and database based out of these four core services you can design any infrastructure you want now these providers are aws is one of the ADA infrastructure provider google provider azure also provide ibm then ec2 there are a lot of services alibaba who provides you infrastructure as a service. Using this infrastructure as a service, platform as a service and software as a service has been distributed. Now let's consider what exactly infrastructure as a service. Infrastructure as a service, when you want to start basics from the basics, that is you create an operating system, you create a storage system and you design your application. On AWS, we have uh, EC2 machine, which is called as a server. We have storage called S3, EPS, EFS. So using this system, if you design any infrastructure, that is considered as an infrastructure as a service. Now platform as a service is, you can see here an example, AWS Elastic Beanstalk. Now Elastic Beanstalk is a service on the AWS, which provide you config, configuration of your server, configuration of your load balancer, and auto scaling, cloud watch matrix, and everything. Whatever you want to design the infrastructure, it has everything pre installed, pre designed. Your job is to just select the operating system, which one you want, maybe Ubuntu, maybe a Windows, whatever the operating system you want. And then you tell them which platform do you want to choose Java, .NET, Go, Ruby, Rails, Python, whatever the platform you want to go. You select that Python, uh, you select that platform, and you deploy your code. The rest of the job, creation of resources, managing of this resource, uh, managing of these resources, will taken care by this AWS. So the comparison now, when it comes to infrastructure as a service, you create a resource, you manage a resource, you configure the resource, you deploy the resource, and all is something everything is something that you need to do and you need to configure this part aws will just provide you the resources whereas in the platform as a service aws will create a resource for you aws will manage a resource for you aws will configure a resource for you your job is to just deploy the code deploy the code also in terms of you need, you just need to upload the code configuration of that code Deploying the code into a specific diet is again job done by the AWS. So this is a different infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. Now third comes the software as a service. That is creation of resource, managing of resource, allocation of resource, configuration of resource, and deploying of resource is all done by this third party services. Your job is to just interact with this application. Best example is Google Docs. We can just go to the Google Docs and we can use this service. We cannot change the application from Google Docs. We cannot go to Microsoft Office. We cannot change that part. Whatever the software is deployed, we need to use the same software. 
but again it's a cloud based storage system whatever the document that you will create that will be stored on the cloud platform so these are the three models infrastructure as a service platform as a service and software as a service now the main aim of our course of our session is to understand infrastructure as a service because there where you stand right now to design any kind of infrastructure that you want so we will be studying and we will be working at the high level to design any kind of infrastructure that we want it may be a netflix it may be a prime or it may be a apple amazon whatever the infrastructure they have a giant infrastructure you can design any infrastructure on this we will see high level of all the different services which can be used for designing such infrastructure so ravi prakash has this doubt that is is hypervisor machine dependent uh right hypervisor is machine dependent now there are different types of hypervisors available native to hypervisor or in type 2 hypervisor there are these two types of hypervisor available when we talk about the para virtualization this para virtualization machine depends on the host machine that is whatever the kernel that you have used it depends on that so if you are diverting that traffic if you are replicating this infrastructure to another region or to another machine again you need to make sure that the same kernel is been used by this para virtualized machine if that hypervisor is directly deployed on the hardware at that time you don't have any dependencies at that time whenever you want to replicate this infrastructure you can replicate it anywhere you want so this is the different hypervisor is machine dependent only for the para virtualization technique for hyper virtualization you do are not dependent on or this hypervisor is not dependent on any machine it can be deployed on any higher hardware and that hardware can be again replicated to any hardware other there is no dependency all right so on this service model do you have any doubt any questions all right next come the deployment models so we have seen this public cloud we have heard this public cloud private cloud hybrid cloud so what exactly these are now the difference between a public cloud and private cloud comes in two direction once uh, that comes with the hardware sharing that is a common hardware is shared between across different aws account or a hardware is share is allocated to a single customer only so that is again a public and private cloud another difference of public and private cloud is when a company gives you public cloud access it means all the security related things security like uh, providing a security uh, firewall protection and everything this is something that needs to be managed by the company vendor by that vendor needs to manage all this part but a private cloud is something that this company will offer you only resources it will only manage the resources for you it will never work on the firewall it will never work on how you are using the security a dedicated hardware will be allocated to a single customer and they will only manage the hardware part they don't care about the software part designing of firewall designing of servers configuration of server that is all something that you need to do by yourself so if you are aware of this dell emc these are the cloud provider vmware red hat this only companies take care of the hardware which is dedicated to a single customer these are companies only take care of the hardware it doesn't uh, interact with the security related things or the configuration part whereas the public cloud vendors like aws azure google cloud platform they take care of your configuration creation of resources managing of resources and everything so this is the difference here the third is the hybrid cloud and hybrid cloud can be anything hybrid cloud between two public cloud maybe you have one infrastructure on aws and there is another infrastructure on google cloud platform now you can connect these two infrastructure together that can be called as hybrid cloud a hybrid cloud can be a public and a private cloud 
that is a part of your infrastructure is on AWS and a part of your infrastructure is on Dell EMC. Let's consider. Then when you connect these two things, it becomes a hybrid cloud. It can be again one public cloud and another on-premise infrastructure. Let's say there is a company who is working on uh, security related things, security uh, manager of their users, data, etc. So for such companies, having the customer data on their own device is only the good option. Like they have a, you know, um, they have restrictions that they cannot upload their users' data on the public cloud, or they cannot create infrastructure on the private cloud. They have such kind of issues with that. So what usually this company do is they store every critical data, every important data on their on premise and the entire infrastructure is designed on the cloud. Maybe a Google cloud, a AWS cloud, whatever the cloud they have. They design the entire cloud there and then they connect their application with an on premise storage. So this is again called as hybrid cloud. So these are the three deployment models. Now moving ahead, there are different types of hypervisors as we were talking about the para virtualization and the hyper virtualization. Here we have these two types of hypervisor. First is type two hypervisor. That is on top of the hardware. You have an operating system, maybe your Windows operating system, maybe Linux, whatever you have. And then there is a hypervisor which distributes this hardware into multiple servers, multiple another virtual machines. Now this kind of hardware is dependent on the operating system. That is this hardware is dependent on this operating system. If this operating system changes, then this will not be supported. You need to always make sure that this operating system uses the same kernel as this operating system. This is called para virtualization. This, uh, this hypervisor is dependent on this kernel. Whereas the type one that is native of bare metal, on top of the hardware, you have a hypervisor and on top of that, you can create a number of resources that you want. So here there is no dependencies. If you want to replicate this Linux machine to another region or anywhere, you can easily uh, take a snapshot and design your infrastructure there. There is no dependencies required. Is there but in this case you need to make sure that this snapshot has the same kernel level properties as this operating system which is called as para virtualization and in this concept we have hyper virtualization which do not have any dependencies now AWS offers you both kind of hypervisor para virtualization and hyper virtualization all right so that was a very quick uh, basics to the AWS, uh, to the cloud computing actually. Uh, okay. Yes. You just you know, general question on these two, type one and type two. In which okay. cases you know, we should be going for either of the, you know, the type services? Like, which is generally they go with you know, most of the you know, cases. Mm -hmm. and, right. So I tell you the general scenario when a company goes for a para virtualization when uh, what are the benefits of having the hyper virtualization. So if you compare the uh, speed and the performance of a para virtualization and a hyper virtual uh, EC2 machine or any guest operating system, a para virtual machine gives you fast performance because it contains the same kernel as the guest operating system as the host operating system. So it has that capability to run that infrastructure at high speed. So para virtualization will give you a high uh, more performance than a hyper virtual machine. But again, with that condition, there is a one condition that this machine cannot be replicated in another region or this machine cannot be replicated within the same region. If there is, uh, you know, uh, there is a uh, less number of resources available because when we talk about the auto scaling we need to make sure that the same kernel is available because para virtual machine is dependent on kernel level so at that time you need to uh, think about it 
before designing an infrastructure that whenever in auto scaling mode, whenever new EC2 instance will come up, it has the same kernel feature available. And that is supported by your applications too. Because in future, if you move your application to another operating system or to hyper virtual machine, at that time, this dependency will create a lot of problem. So here, the dependency is only completely on the kernel level. If the kernel changes, you are not supported anymore to the new application that you have designed. So mostly, most of the companies do not prefer to go with the para virtual machine. They always prefer to have a hyper virtual machine as there is no dependency. And when it comes to the performance wise, they increase the number of size of machines they have. There is not a lot much of difference between the performance wise, but yes, there is a difference. Okay. Uh, how about the cost? Cost is approximately same. It depends on the instance type that is a configuration, two core CPU, four GB RAM, four core CPU, six GB RAM, what configuration you are using, it depends on that. Plus, on AWS, it de also depends on the region. Every region will have a separate uh, pricing models available because in some region, electricity and internet is cheaper than another region. We'll see how, what are the different regions on AWS and what is the you know, pricing comparison also. All right. Okay. So now AWS, AWS is a broad set of infrastructure service such as again the computing, storage, networking and database. It also offers you the infrastructure as a services. With the delivery of on-demand, available in second and pay as you go pricing. That is whenever you want any resources, a storage system, a server system, a database system, you can create that resource. And these resources will be available for you within only seconds. You don't need to wait for a long period of time. It will be available for you within second. And with the future that pay as you go pricing, that is the number of minutes, the number of time period that you will use this server, you will be only charged for that pay as you go model. So on AWS, there are hundreds of services available and you don't get charged for all the services. What is the number of consumption you do? Based on that, you will get charged. Certain benefits of AWS, that is, it's easy to use. Uh, basically, you don't need to design, uh, you don't need to download any application on your system to interact with your AWS services. The entire AWS console is available on the browser. So you just need to log into the AWS management console with your username password and you can have access to all the hundreds of services. Second is the flexibility that we have already discussed that you can easily upgrade and download your infrastructure. So AWS provides that completely flexibility. Reliability, AWS is, AWS infrastructure is created in 21 different regions worldwide. That is in US, UK, Australia, Singapore, India, there are 21 different regions where AWS infrastructure is created. And you can design your infrastructure in any of this region. So if your customers are located in US region, then you can design your infrastructure in US so that your client will interact to their data easily. With a low latency network, they can interact to their data. And AWS makes sure that whatever the infrastructure you design, whatever the data that you will upload, that data will be replicated within its ability zone, within its data center. So that if any component failure occurs at hardware level or the entire data center is down due to some reason, then it has a capability to replicate or to restore your existing data. So there is very less chances that your data will be lost. AWS guarantees 99.99% of availability guarantee and the reliability guarantee. So it at the back end, at the back end, it automatically replicates the data, which can be only used in case there is any component failure from AWS side, not from your side. 
even if you lose any kind of data you have mistakenly deleted the actual production server or the database server you cannot restore that database again unless you have the backup copy you cannot restore the data it can be only restored if it the same mistake has been take, uh, done from the aws side maybe from the component failure maybe from the database data center side if in that case only this data will be restored cost effective like the auto scaling features and other aws managed services which offers you by default scaling and management service thing is very cost effective solution scalable and high performance scalable and high performance can be judged from two most of the aws services call as load balancer and auto scaling this take care of your entire infrastructure that is is always up and running we will see in detail what are these services and secure which is a very important part when it comes to the infrastructure so aws provides a security at every layer at server level at security level at resource level at account level at uh, monitoring and uh, auditing level at every layer aws provides different levels of security we'll see every minor details in our every aws services now next come is the global infrastructure the one that we are talking about that aws has 21 different regions data centers and all the things that is global infrastructure so here it is that global infrastructure the orange circle that you see here are the different aws regions available worldwide these are the 21 different regions available now in each of this orange circle you see there is a count uh, 2 6 4 etc so these are the number of copies of data centers in each of this region that is in india if you see here there are two so in india there are two data centers available currently but recently last week last to last week aws has created another data center in mumbai which is uh, which is now three data centers total we have in india so currently they are increasing the number of data centers as the dip, uh, as the demand for the cloud computing is increasing they are also expanding their services in different different regions and they are also increasing the number of data centers copies now this data center copies are exactly the replication of the existing data centers which means if in india there are three data centers then all these three data centers are identical copy of each other the number of servers the number of networking configuration and everything that has in first infrastructure in first data center will be exactly copy from another data center so aws is currently having 21 different regions these are called region and the circles in the uh, what is green color these are the upcoming regions that aws is planning to come in the nearby futures with these four different regions now there will be no case that aws will be available with only one data centers AWS make sure that without having two data centers in each of this region, they will no go live. So you have two data centers minimum in all the regions, minimum two data centers. And as per the well architecture framework, you should design your infrastructure in high availability. That is, you need to distribute your infrastructure in both the regions, in both the ability zone. We'll see in detail. That is AWS global infrastructure spans across 61 ability zones as of now. Within 20, 20 geographic region, now it's 21 and more than 61 ability zone. The number of uh, services, the number of designs, the number of infrastructure resources they have, it is spread across 21 geographic location and 61 already zone and they have announced 12 more already zone with additional four aws regions a region a region is nothing but a geographic separated area it's physically location in the world where there are multiple already zones available that is 
a region can be a us region uk region australia india mumbai any region and inside of this region we have availability zone that is data centers so the number of data centers you have is called multi availability zone each data center is called availability zone and the more you have is called multi availability zone so you should design your infrastructure in multi availability zone how to do that we'll see in vpc part vpc is completely networking part so availability zone offers an easier and effective way to design and operate applications and database making them only highly available fault tolerant and scaling just the basics and then we have each location now each locations are more than 160 each locations available worldwide in india itself we have five each locations and each location is nothing but a cache location where user data is cached to understand this let's take a very basic example uh, do you know guys tiktok musically netflix apple then samsung mi all this company we have heard so much now what this company does is whenever they want to roll out any features they use content delivery network or each location to distribute their data so for example a user sitting in uk has uploaded a video on the internet all right on a specific website maybe it's a instagram maybe it's a pinterest maybe it's whatever it is platform has uploaded a video i am sitting in the india trying to access that video so we know the basics of our networking that is sitting in india i need to travel to uk to take that application to tag uh, to take that video and come back to india to watch that video that is i need to i need to travel number of hopes between india to uk it may be 300 milliseconds it may be 400 milliseconds based on the video size and etc whatever it will it will be in the milliseconds so i need to travel to that location grab that video come back to india and watch that video now what content delivery network does is if in between me and that uk video is there any content delivery network option available then then the first time when i access the video that video data will be cached into my local regional location that is in each location so next time whenever from india anyone who is trying to access the same video they don't need to go to the uk and grab that video and watch it they will get the data from its own regional location from its own cache location so now if it took me to travel to uk and grab that video if it like a 400 millisecond so definitely next time any user who wants to take the same video will require less than 400 millisecond maybe 160 200 300 whatever the latency will be definitely it will be less than 400 so each location plays a very important role on aws to deliver your content faster and content delivery network in aws the service is called aws cloud front this market aws cloud front is one of the most important service and this is the one of the most commonly used aws services by different aws customers top customer for this services are netflix apple amazon prime hulu all the entertainment channel media services uses these services instagram penetrace pinterest everyone is using this each location and the content delivery network to distribute their traffic okay uh, so till now any question any doubt yeah one second then. yeah Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. How this edge location uh, uh, chase is associated with the data centers? Is there any link with the uh, local uh, data centers? 
yeah basically all aws infrastructure is connected to each other it may be your ability zone or the age location all are connected to each other but you can only design your infrastructure on ability zone the rest of the part will uh, that is on caching the data will not be on ability zone your age location will only serve the data which is been cached on this age location you cannot create any resource any ec2 machine any sc bucket or you cannot design any infrastructure this location only serve the cache data and these all are connected together in a aws infrastructure okay uh, what if uh, it's uh, someone is something like thousands of uh, people are streaming the some uh, some videos uh, from the other regions at the, at the same time at same instant is there any effect to the this uh, this edge location uh, servers no basically so how it works like let me just show you a diagram uh just consider this diagram so you're not very easy let's consider this is your server and number of servers you have let's consider this is a netflix application and there are multiple servers is running for the ec2 machine or uh, multiple servers are running all right and then uh, here comes your content delivery network and then let's consider this is you okay these are the people who are trying to access this video so these people if there is no content delivery network available then these people will directly hit to the server grab the video and they will come back to the user's location and access the data but when it comes to the content delivery network in uh, in between this aws services then at that time this user will head to the content delivery network content delivery network will check whether the data that user is requesting is the same data which is in cache in the original cache location that is let's say there there is one file name abc and age 40 this is the data that user is fetching all right this data is present in the content delivery network so whenever a user will interact to the content delivery network it will check whether this file content is same which is present on the actual server or not if the data is same then this content delivery network will divert the traffic to the nearest age location and the data will be responded back to the user let's say the data has been updated with age 41 so age location has the data age 40 but the server has updated the data age 41 so every time you request to the server to the cloud front or the content delivery network it checks the data which has been changed from the last time so now it checks with the server whether the data has been changed or not. If there is any change in data, then again it will pull the data from the server that the latest copy says the age 41. It will copy the content and store on the age location again. And this age location data will be reverted back to the user. Now here comes the another important point. What if the users are situated in different regions? How it will affect the latency? So the best part of this cloud fund technology is you can create this content delivery network in multiple locations in multiple regions you can create a um, age location in india in us in uk in singapore so every time any person trying to access from this region the data will be cached into that location so it support multi-regional infrastructure it, you can design this infrastructure in multiple regions and every time that particular user from user uh, from us or uk 
will fetch the data from their own cache location, not from the server. All right. That was your question, Gopi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now, uh, just guys, tell me from your understanding. Let's say at the server, I have 20 different servers. Okay. The number of servers that are running to design this application is required 20 different servers. Now I have placed content delivery network. So do I require to still have 20 different servers or I can reduce the size of servers? What do you think? You can reduce, you can reduce the server size. Right? Of course, because our load will be on cloud front and the data will be cached back to the each location. The load will be not on the EC2 server. So we can technically reduce the number of sites the uh, total count of the EC2 server. Instead of 20, we can have 10 or 12. Definitely based on the different scenario, it will go. But actually we can reduce the number of server. So again, we can save the number of cost here because server cost is high compared to the content delivery network. Same time, the data latency, that is the amount of data which has been delivered to the user, the amount of time that it has taken will be again reduced because of this content delivery network, the data will be cached. The cached data will be delivered to the user easily than going to the server and taking back the data and coming to the source location and deploying the data. Correct? So in that case, this plays a very important role of having an infrastructure with content delivery system. And the best part of this content delivery system is you can write any data in this part that is it can support static as well as dynamic data so even if you are having a php application .NET application whatever the application you are designed all can support this content delivery network if you have a static contents with gps of data like, like like we have considered this example of netflix so they have a video files in gb so that can be easily delivered to the user without any extra cost all right. One uh, out of the box question, box question like, uh, do you see any any role of uh, content uh, you know, delivery network in IoT you know, use cases? IoT, uh, like what kind of IoT services you are looking for? Like every uh, IoT has a different purpose. <laughs> Let's say you know anything. Uh, can you consider on the edge computing like? Okay, basically, where you can use this content delivery network. In short, now you can apply to various kinds of applications. When you have a common data or a dynamic data with a specific application that needs to be distributed across different AWS customer or different your clients uh, who is interacting to your application on the internet, you can use this service not with the real-time processing of the data like most of the iot devices are continuously upload the data am i correct this device is continually upload the data its location or whatever the tracking you are doing they completely yes. real-time data they upload it so at that time this service will not be useful but the data which you want to show on the browser or on the service that you want to deliver the thing that you want to deliver, you can use this content delivery network. When you are asking user to import your data, that is mostly of the IoT devices uh, consumes the data. That is, you are consuming IoT devices data. At the time, this data will not be useful. It is only useful to deliver the data, not to input the data. Yes, I know if I have a new server, I have a data, so until it gets cached with the uh, edge location, no, there will be a latency, right? Yeah. Will there be any latency for the user? Yeah, there will be a slightly a uh, little latency. This latency okay, will be dependent upon your time to live. That is, okay. every time whenever user interact with your cloud front the request will not be sent to the server to check whether the data is updated or not. 
when this communication will happen based on this content delivery network configuration that is time to leave so here you configure a time to leave that is after one minute after 30 minutes after three uh, one day two day based on your configuration the time to uh, that you will set it will check the data with the server so for example out of 24 hours if i have set the prayer that after every single hour, you need to check the data, whether do you have the updated data or not. Then after this 24 hours, it will only request 24 times only to that particular server that to check whether the data is updated or not. Always after one hour, again, it will check whether the data is updated or not. If there is any change in data, then it will fetch the data. Otherwise, it will not interact with this EC2 server, with this server. So if you have left a very you know, short period of uh, time to live, then there will be high latency. If you have given one hour, two hour, whatever the time frame based on the different scenario, then again, the latency becomes low. At that time, user will directly interact with the site and the data will be fetched back to the user. At that time, there will be no latency or very less latency. Time to leave for the to remain on the network or it get refreshed uh, sorry pardon is there any time period for even uh, the data which is cached and it gets wiped out or something yeah that is time to live that you need to specify that time frame when you want to okay. refresh the data when you want to delete the older data uh, Lalit uh, Ravi here uh, as Gopi said, like uh, uh, when it comes to the IoT edge devices, uh, yes. sometimes what happens is we are going to we are going to work on the multimedia services also. For example, uh, extracting the video from the edge device and uh, putting into the uh, AWS servers or uh, some other servers. When it comes right. to this content delivery network, how this will helps in, in in delivering the services to the customers? Okay, first of all. If you are fetching some data from the user's input, that is from the user's device, if you are fetching some data, that this content delivery network will not be useful. It is only used for delivering the data from your server to the end user. So if there is an, any data present on your EC2 server or on any kind of storage system, S3 bucket or EC2 machine, that content, if you want to deliver to the, your users, at that time only content delivery network will come into the picture if you are taking some user data and trying to process something and then you are giving some data at that time it won't be helpful am i correct uh, this was your yeah. query yes yes, yes. Okay. now here comes a very important model that is share responsibility share responsibility model this is very important to understand as a solution architect and for the certification point of view. For what part you are responsible for designing an infrastructure on the cloud and for what part AWS is responsible. So let's see first AWS responsibility. AWS is responsible for hardware and the global infrastructure like regions ability zone and age location maintaining this location maintaining this hardware and the global infrastructure is taken care by the aws this is not our job this is job of a aws <clears throat> similarly software software like computing power soft uh, networking database and networking maintaining all this part is again a job of a aws storage database networking computing all this configuration, doing configuration, designing what application they are offering, everything that comes with the AWS side, this is their job. This is not comes our responsibility. So where we stand? As a customer of AWS, this is our responsibility to encrypt our data because this is a public cloud. So we need to encrypt our data. We need to make sure that, uh, you know, in case in any kind of hack, hacking is happening then again uh, we are still protected to our environment we are still protected to our data so we can do client side encryption server side encryption and network traffic protection 
the amazing part of AWS is by default all networking traffic is denied all TCP port all UDP port every single traffic is denied on AWS you need to specifically tell AWS which port you want to allow so if you are having the web application running on your EC2 server then at that time you need to specifically allow that a user can hit a request from the browser at port 443 that is HTTPS so that particular port you need to allow here on the AWS level and only that port will be allowed no other port will be allowed unless you open that port this is really amazing because when it comes to an on-premise infrastructure and other private cloud this is something that you need to design you need to block all the ports you need to open the ports which is required but this networking traffic protection automatically comes with aws which all denies the port then it's again your responsibility to choose what what operating system you want to go with ubuntu linux whatever the thing you want to go windows it's up to you network and firewall the firewall in AWS is called security group that is denying and allowing a port is called security group that is a firewall to your server we'll see in detail maintaining that part is again your responsibility the platform that you want to run platform version python 3.6 python 2.7 python 3.7 what platform you want to run how you want to run how you want to configure this is your responsibility what application you want to run again it comes with your responsibility as uh, this is your data and then we have identity and access management which is a great service management service as a solution architect this is your job like every company for their uh, infrastructure will have one aws account and this company will have n numbers of participants and number of team members like you you are five team members who are working on AWS infrastructure. So how your company will give you access to their AWS account? That part we'll see in identity access management. Now, of course, AWS offers you hundreds of services. So as a solution architect, you will not configure that to all the team members, you can have access to my AWS account. Do whatever you want to do. We are working on infrastructure level. So we need to restrict every single participant from their action. A developer team members can only have access to the developer tools. An AI team members should have all the resources which is required for only AI. An IoT based user team members can only have access to the IoT based application. No other resources should be allowed. So this allocation of resources, authentication and authorizing of AWS account is a job done with the identity and access management and this is the first service that we'll see in our aws services today we will see this part how you can give authentication and authorization to your team members and then lastly comes the customer data that is your data how you can protect it how you store it how you use this with your application all right so this is very important to understand at a high level what is your responsibility what is aws responsibility basically there will be hardly a single question on the exam but you can consider it for designing and understanding the scenario and when you are interacting with your client for designing infrastructure on the cloud this is a little slightly important then there is a lot of certifications available i think you already are aware of this are you want me to go? Do, do you guys know all the yeah. uh, different certifications? Yeah, just you can know how higher we can read the sum. Okay. So there is a very small uh, practitioner certification available. Uh, basically, this practitioner cloud practitioner certification is only useful for the sales people and the non-technical managers to have a basic idea about the all the different AWS services like what is EC2, what is S3, what is, uh, you know, 
uh, cloud front and all the services just very basic idea for the associate level certification there are three associate level certification available first is solution architect where their job is to design and understand the different scenarios different understand the different requirements and design and infrastructure this design infrastructure will be deployed and implemented by the developers. Uh, the developers, how to configure, how to create a resource on the AWS. This is their job. And then third comes with a certificate, sysop administrator, who manages the IAM part, who manages your application services, who creates a report, uh, alarms, and other things to maintain your AWS cloud. Then comes two, level, two certifications at the professional level. That is solution architect professional. Now the difference between an associate and the professional is in exam, you will get more complex scenarios. Basically 90% of the questions that you will get in exam associate also are scenario based. They will ask you like there is a company XYZ who is working on this, this model. Their requirement is this, this what do you suggest a better solution and then there will be a four solutions available uh, in the drop down list you need to select you need to understand all the four different scenarios and you need to select the valid answer out of them that is this kind of mcqs you need to select one of the answers so 90 percent of the question will be based on the scenario and 10 percent question will be based on uh, just you need to select uh, the valid answers like which is the storage based service you can just select for S3. Uh, what is EC2? EC2 is just nothing but a computing power on the cloud. There will be a small, uh, you know, just very small questions available that you can pick. And then there is a DevOps certification available for the professional level. Now this DevOps is a combination of associate level developers and associate level sysops. Both are uh, both combination of this certification is comes with the professional level and which gives you high complexity of questions uh, the scenarios and everything will be little complex and then there are four different specialty level certification available if you or your team members or your company is working on one of this model then you can go with the specialty certification you will also get benefited and your company also get benefit when they represent uh, themselves in front of their clients so they have this kind of certifications available that is security based certification big data networking machine learning and recently aws has also introduced one more specialty level certification do you guys know what is alexa it's a artificial intelligence tool yeah, so you can also design your AI, uh, you know, Alexa skills, and that skill uh, represent your specialty level certification. So moving ahead, how many of you, uh, do you all have AWS account? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, I hope then you must have credit or debit card with yourself. Because whenever you create an AWS account, uh, you will require a credit debit card, and Amazon will deduct two rupee, I not two rupee from your from your bank account, which will be refunded back within fourteen days. This is just to verify your AWS account, All right? So you can just visit to this site awsamazon.com/account. I'm copying the same link to the chat screen. You can also click on there. And then here you click on create an AWS account. Uh, it would be good if one of you can share your screen so that I can show you how to design, how to create an AWS account. Basically, I have already an AWS account. So it doesn't matter, it will not, useful so who is sharing uh, your screen i can make them presenter now you want to do it right? 
uh, yeah, because uh, before we go ahead and design our infrastructure cloud and drive with our application, we need to have a AWS account. Okay, uh, we thought like you know this uh, the test account will be provided from your side only. Sorry, once again. This you know the logins uh, for the time purpose. Uh, this account uh, no, login credentials will be given from your side. Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, basically, like if you have a common AWS account, then it will be very confusing. Like if you have four or five servers, it will be difficult to understand which server belongs to which one. Okay, you can go ahead and then start using your account. Just to show because registration should be fine, you know, good enough. We we'll later we can discuss on that. But you can continue with the service, you know, what you want to explain. And how will you perform the lab session then? Yeah, exactly. Like you know, that is something like I'm going to talk to uh, Shubham also on the offline. Okay. So Let you me know, just... now we want to have uh, the uh, the uh, lab session as well uh, with the you know when you're explaining okay. the. Uh, yeah, I will check with Shubham. Just give me one minute. I will check with Shubham and we can uh, discuss on this. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. 
so yeah, I checked with the Shubham. Uh, he is little outside, so he said that you will get AWS account access by next half. That is when we connect back on 1:30. At that time, you will get an AWS account access. Okay. Okay. Well. Yeah, but guys, I would recommend like if you want to try uh, by your own, then you must have your AWS account with you, and it will not oh, charge. Okay. That will sure we will do that one. So yeah. So basically, whenever you create a free account or whenever you create a AWS account, you get certain services for free. Okay. Certain services which are for twelve months free, and certain services which are always free. So what are the services? Let's see. I will first select the twelve months free. That is your EC2 machine. That is your actual server. So you get seven fifty hours per month for free. That is, if you distribute the seven fifty hours into twenty four hours per day, you get thirty one days absolutely free. But here it comes with a single to condition that you need to, sorry, you need to use T2 Micro. What basically a T2 Micro is? It's just one of the processor. It's just one of the instance type that offers you two core CPU. Sorry, one core CPU and one GB RAM. This is the only condition that you need to stick with this T2 Micro only. If you exceed uh, above this T2 Micro, it will be chargeable to you. So if you remain in this limitation T2 Micro, then you get 750 hours per month for free, which is available for you next 12 months. Then here you have storage that is called S3. S3 again gives you 5 GB of storage per month with 20,000 get requests and 2,000 put requests. So again, it's uh, absolutely free here. You can have, uh, you can create resources, you can dump whatever the data you want, and you can try whatever you want. Third is a database service that is Amazon Managed Database Service. Unlike you don't need to design all this kind of servers. And then you don't need to install this uh, database here, like uh, MySQL, OGRI SQL, MariaDB, Oracle, and Microsoft SQL Server. Here you don't need to install all the servers. It comes with pre-installed Amazon Managed Services. The benefit that you get with this Amazon Managed Services is the backup options. You can have automatic backups. You can have manual backup within only few clicks. But when you consider a server on which you have created your own database, on which you want to take a snapshot, it becomes a very tedious job. But here, on AWS Managed Services, it's just a few clicks, and you have your backup ready. It also gives you various kinds of features that we'll see. This again gives you 750 hours. That comes again again same condition that is T2 Micro. You need to use again T2 Micro only. Then there is an API gateway service available, which offers you one million API gateways per month for free. One million API gateways per month for free. Cloud Directory, which is a directory tool for building up your database and the hierarchies of your organization, is again one GB for per month for free. The CloudFront that we are talking about, the content delivery network. Here is a CloudFront technology, which offers you 50 GB of data transfer out every month. Then comprehend, connect, EFS system. EFS will see in our lab session what is EFS, uh, which is also gives you 5 GB of storage per month for free. If you just use the site, you get it. I'm sharing with your chat you can also visit to this site and the e ebs volume that we will use it only gives you 30 gb per month so you can use the services elastic container registry a lot of services are available and then there are certain services which is always free like dynamo db which offers your 25 gb of storage every month for free lambda Lambda is a service which is serverless. Have you ever heard about this AWS Lambda? Well, this is one of the most popular service currently in the market. Lambda is a service which gives you a computing power without creation of a server. That is serverless. 
you don't need to create a server you don't need to configure a server you don't need to do anything you just need to pick a platform like a uh, python ruby node.js go language whatever the platform you want to choose you need to use that particular platform and then you need to deploy your code that's it aws takes care of uh, creation of resources creation of servers load balancing auto scaling everything is taken care by the aws so this is one of the most popular service then we have push notification service which also offers you 1 million request cloudwatch chime cognito there are a lot of services available for you you can try so once you have aws account once you log in you see this is the aws management console and there are a lot of services available you can see these are all the services there are few services available for computing storage we have lots of services database migration and transfer there are a lot of services available next part is your north virginia that is your region selection as you can see there are lots of regions available us east one us east two us west one west two Cal california oregon hong kong mumbai seoul singapore sydney these are basically 18 different regions and two or three regions uh, is actually disabled for my aws account which i haven't enabled so these are few more aws uh, regions available and there are two more regions uh, which is only restricted to us government and china government you cannot access to this region these regions are very specifically designed for only for the purpose of us government and china government they can only have access to this aws region so this public cloud is actually using by these two governments which is really you can consider now how reliable the solutions they provide now if you want to raise us any support ticket you can just click on support centers and if you want to increase any size limit or anything that you want to interact with the aws team members you can raise a support team here comes your management part that is my account if i click here then this is my account id that is every account has 12 digit of account id which is unique then contact information and everything alternative numbers and the one that i was talking about this hong kong region is disabled and these are the other regions which is available on the aws now there is a service called my billing dashboard a billing dashboard will give you the because the consumption that you have made apart from your free tier exceeded from your free tier which has cost you so whatever the consumption that you'll do whatever the uh, you know cost will affect to your system you will find it in the billing dashboard now whenever you create a hello yes pradeep Hello, are you saying something? Hello, Pradeep. Hello, can you hear me now? Hello, can you hear me now? Hello.
Hello, Lalit. Yeah, I can hear you. Hey, Pratik. Okay. Your voice is echoing. Uh, where is Gopi? Gopi left? So can you hear me right now you can hear me everyone can you hear me now Hello. Hello. Could you just type me a message? Uh, because your voice is echoing. I cannot understand. Hello. Hello, guys. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me now? Lalit? Yes. Yeah, Pratip, I can hear you now. Hello. Let me know guys when you can hear me, we'll start. Hello.
Hello, now can you hear me? Hello. Like, can you hear us now? Like, can you hear us now? Um, I can hear you, but your voice is going. Yeah, it's done, you know. Uh, we can hear you now. Okay, <laughs> great. So, shall we start again? Yeah, I think your voice is a little feeble, you know. We are not able to, you know, clearly listen. Can you talk now? Hello? No. Can you hear us like late now? Hello? Can you hear me now? Is it clear and loud? Yeah, it's not louder. Like, you know, we can hear you, but it's not uh, louder. Um, I think from my side, it's, everything is uh, fine. Yeah, hi, Lalit. Hi, can you hear me now? Clear? Yes, yes. Audio is perfectly fine. I'm able to hear you. Yeah, I think, Gopi, you need to check from your side once again. Uh, I can see the screen also. It's AWS IM. And it's completely fine. Reconnect money. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Now looks okay. Now it's fine. Okay. So uh, we have left the billing part. So once you have AWS account, then we will see this billing part, how you can configure and everything. Let's jump to the first AWS service that is AWS Identity Access Management (IAM). As a solution architect and uh, as a head of your department or any whenever you want to configure or whenever you want to give access to your team member this service plays an important role so let's consider you want to design an infrastructure for your team members or uh, for your one of the client so the way that you will give access to your team members this is the first service that you want to interact with that identity access management <laughs> So yeah, good to start, right? We can start, right? Please, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So AWS Identity Access Management is a web service that helps you to securely control access to the resources for your user. Which means if any particular users are only interacting to the storage service, then you should give them only storage access. If any developer team wants to have access to your Lambda or EC2, then you should give them only that particular access. You should not give entire access to the AWS account because here we are talking about the infrastructure and we should not, uh, we should uh, maintain all the security level, level things for our team members, what they can access, what they cannot, how they can be controlled here. 
so with this i am you have complete control over authentication and authorization authorization of users authorization of the team members and authentication to what services they can have access what are the benefits of using this iam first it enhances the security level like depend upon the user's role you can provide them access if this if this is just a manager non technical manager who want to have a list of all the services that you have created who just want to have list what services what exactly this team is team members are doing you can just give them list only access or read only access so that these people will not interrupt to your infrastructure so you have granular control based on the user's role manager junior people senior members administrative access you can give them kind of controls there you have option to create a temporary credential now one of the aws best practices says that you should not share your own credential or the root credential with anyone not for a single minute because we are talking about the infrastructure so it's not at all recommended that you should share the your credentials in that case what you can do is you can create temporary credential temporary credential you can specify the time you can create a temporary credential and that you can share this credential with that x person maybe some expert people you have called for troubleshooting your infrastructure so you should not give them your system to configure that part you should give them temporary credential so that they can have access to that particular service and that troubleshoot with their expertise so with this you can create temporary credentials it also offers you flexible security credential management so as a solution architect you if one of your team members has lost their access key secret key lalit we are not able to hear you and lastly but best one of the most important part is you can leverage external identity system sorry to interrupt yeah. actually i think in few minutes back we could not hear you in between uh starting from the anon security temporary credentials from the temporary credentials okay so temporary credentials when uh, if you have called someone from expertise on aws to troubleshoot your infrastructure like in our normally day to day life we have we experience such kind of things we call some expertise people to troubleshoot some of the things so if you have that case then you can create a temporary credentials that a user can access to their your aws account for example like you are my client and uh, i want to interact with my infrastructure uh, that is you want to interact with my infrastructure that i have designed on aws account so instead of sharing a root credential or my credential with you what i can do is i can create a temporary credential in that case what will happen you will log into your aws account i will log into my aws account and from your aws account to my aws account i will create a role that role defines what permissions you can have and for what how long you can have is called cross account access from one aws account to second aws account so technically if you want to have access to my aws account for troubleshooting anything or for in accessing my aws services i don't need to create another credentials for you i just need to create a role that will allow you to have that access to my aws account so we are talking now about two aws account many companies with big infrastructure what they do they have different different aws account for their different role a aws account for production infrastructure and aws account for test infrastructure for staging etc 
so a user will have only test account access whatever they want to do they can have on the test aws account and once that their code is deployed and everything is working now one of the user can update that code into the production infrastructure with this temporary credentials then comes the flexibility security credential management so if your team members is facing any kind of uh, access problem that is if a person has lose their access key secret key or they want to reset their password then you have that complete management console where within a few clicks you can do also in case as a solution architect you want to add any permission to this user or you want to revoke any permission you can do this management console now the last but the least most important part is you can leverage external identity system that is you can import users from another account and another system identity can be your active directory of your organization every organization has some active directory so you can import that active directory on your aws account and you can leverage these users to have access to your aws account with the same credentials or external identity can be also termed with a second party sign up that is we see most of the social media has a sign up option that is login with google login with facebook login with uh, you know other uh, you know other uh, sites using other social media sites so it also offers you the same you can log in to the aws via external identity system sources like amazon apple google gmail id and facebook id you can leverage these users also to have access to your aws account so you can import this users id identity from the this providers google providers facebook providers and give them access to your aws account that option is also available now this is a very good scenario how you should give them access to their aws account and why you should restrict their access let's consider there is a one dev team in your infrastructure that dev team requires an access to the ec2 machine to the lambda and let's say to the storage s3 these are the different aws services if you want to give these users to have an aws account you can do with creation of their aws account id let's consider there is one more ai team in your uh, in your you know uh, organization which wants to have access to the lex uh, recognition and poly these are the three ai based tools available on aws so if these people want to have access to your aws account for creation of resources and managing of resources you should not give them entire aws account access as a solution architect what you will do you will create a users you will create a group and then you will give them what permission they are looking for if this is the dev team which want to have access to the ec2 lambda and s3 then you will give them that only permission for ai team you will give only lax poly recognition services only what services they are looking for you will give only that particular permission in this way you can control their actions what they can do and they cannot do any question in doubt in this part so far and let me you, you can move forward okay so here comes the most important part of an iam service that is component of iam there are four components users group roles and policy a user is something that is instead of sharing your root credentials that is the first time login the email id and the password what you can do is you can create an iam user using this iam user one can create and one can log in to the aws account
Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So instead of sharing your root credentials with others, you can create individual IAM user. So for example, in my AWS account, if I want you to give access to my AWS. Lalit, you there? Yeah, hi, I'm there. Actually, there's a little noise in the background. That's why I muted myself. Okay. Uh, okay actually, it's a time. So, can we just uh, shift this uh, part to the next session? Because this is, uh, again, a very big part components and creation of these components. And it's already a time. What time you want to start, uh, uh, Lalit? Uh, we will start again after one hour. Exactly at one thirty. Can we make it two o'clock? Uh, sorry, what time? Two o'clock. You mean to say uh, we need to start at four o'clock? No, no, two o'clock. Two o'clock. Two p.m. Yeah. All right, I don't have a problem. Two to four. One second, um, one second. Okay, let uh, Hello, uh, let, let's log in at uh, no, two o'clock. Let's log in at uh, two o'clock. All right. Uh, so Thanks. same link, right? Then there won't be any changes. Just you know, uh, we'll continue with the same ID, meeting ID. No, no. So Gopi, uh, I'll share a mail uh, with you again all. So there will be a different uh, URL or a link to join the session. So I will make certain customization, and from 2 p.m. we'll start the next session. And I'm I'll within uh, 15, 20 minutes I'll drop you mm -hmm. a mail to everybody with a new invite link. Yeah, can you, okay, uh, if you can send it before 145, that'll be good, you know, we will lock Obviously, you. within 15 minutes, I'll send it. Oh, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, because this is a very big part, like components of IAM, this is actually an important part of IAM. So if we start now, it will take uh, another uh, half to 145 minutes. So we can do uh, once in a single shot in the next session. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right, then. Uh, see you at exactly 2 p.m. Okay, thank you. Thank you.